These scoffers are willingly ignorant. That means dumb on purpose. Pre-flood, things were different. I think there was a canopy of water that increased air pressure, which would make animals grow much larger. The Bible says the water above the atmosphere. It's mentioned several times in the Bible. So, the first thing we notice is the Hoban theory isn't actually a theory. It's not even a hypothesis. It's not even a coherent idea. In the first instance, the Hoban theory is that water is in contact with and pushing on the atmosphere, while in the second, it's above the atmosphere and not in contact with it. Now, both of these suggestions are demonstrably stupid, and like most of Hoban's willingly ignorant and dumb on purpose ideas, it's trivial to prove it. The first thing to be said is that the Earth and the solar system are essentially constructs of gravity. All the planets are spheres which are largely filtered by gravity. For instance, look at the Earth. The heavy elements, iron, sulfur, on the inside, and as you move to the outside, you get to the less dense structures such as silicates, which contain lots of lighter element oxygen. Then on the surface, you get the really light stuff, water. That's the hydrogen compound of oxygen, and of course, the gas atmosphere. The one thing that us surface dwellers figure out pretty quick is that great slabs of water do not float in the air. These are not observed as they are simply not gravitationally viable. Now let's let the creationist destroy his own argument. I don't have a clue what the numbers were, but let's just pick a few for sake of argument. Suppose there was a layer of ice 10 or 20 or 30 inches thick above the atmosphere, and then a layer of air, 10 or 15 miles of air to breathe, and then a layer of rocks and dirt to stand on, the crust of the earth, maybe 10 miles, now I'm going to suspend my knowledge of the functioning of the universe for a second and accept that a magical ice shield was poofed into existence on top of the atmosphere. Firstly, it should be recognized that the Hovind ice shield wouldn't survive the first day simply as barometric pressure changes, which take place over hundreds of miles, would fracture the Hovind ice shield, which is only about three feet thick due to stress. This would call it to fall to earth, killing almost everything on the surface of the planet. Secondly, of course, it doesn't matter whether you're in orbit at the equator or on the surface of the equator. You will receive the same energy per unit area. Put simply, ice would survive above the atmosphere at the equator for about as long as it would survive in the desert. Now, the sun supplies enough energy to melt about half a meter of ice per day at the equator. Hovind's ice shield would have melted and fallen to earth within the first day. Clearly, this is inconsistent with Hovind's statement that the ice shield was there for over 2,000 years. So, do you want a second go, Mr. Hovind? Now, if the Bible is right, and the earth had a canopy of water overhead, like the Bible, I think, clearly teaches in 2 Peter 3 and in Genesis 1, 6, and 7, this canopy of water would filter out quite a bit of radiation. Okay, now this picture has serious problems with it. It is first necessary to explain the orders of magnitude of the earth. There is about 6,000 kilometers of planet, followed by about 5 kilometers of water, that's about the size of the arrowhead, followed by about 100 kilometers of atmosphere, that's about the thickness of the red line. On this scale, Hovind's ice shield is about 800 kilometers thick and is at an orbit of about 1,000 kilometers. Now these numbers are congruent with the expected melting rates of such a canopy. If we assume half a meter melts per day, then for an ice canopy to survive 2,000 years, it would need to be about 1,000 kilometers thick. Now, as Hovind states, This canopy of water would filter out quite a bit of radiation. Yep, that amount of ice would filter out a lot of radiation. In fact, it would filter out all of it. Ice is about the same optical density as water. After the first 1,000 meters, you reach a point called the midnight zone, where no light penetrates. So not only would this ice shield block out all light from the surface of the Earth, it wouldn't affect the atmospheric pressure at all, simply because it's not in contact with the atmosphere. Now comes the second problem. Is such an ice shield even consistent with the laws of physics? 
Now this must be ice, simply as if it were not ice and were liquid water in orbit, the frictional heating of water travelling at orbital velocities, that's about 5 kilometers per second, on different orbital paths, on great circles of course, would simply heat the water to incandescence and call it to fall to earth, sterilizing every living thing on earth within hours. However, if we assume that it were physically viable for such a structure to exist, what would happen if it were to fall to earth? Firstly, of course, there's the heating aspect. Objects falling about a thousand kilometers will heat up between one and five thousand degrees upon hitting the ground. Clearly, the mere collapse of the canopy would sterilize every living thing on the planet. Secondly, an ice canopy of the thickness suggested by Hovind would not merely coat the Earth, it would drown it. Currently, the tallest mountains on Earth are about ten kilometers. If Hovind's ice shield did melt and fall to Earth, we would never see the land again. But just for fun, let's take a look at what would happen if we mixed the two contradictory ideas of the Hovind theory. What if there were 800 kilometers of ice sitting on the atmosphere? Well, first it would compress the atmosphere such that it would be about one meter thick. It's about three feet. If we ignore the fact that at this pressure the atmosphere would liquefy, Noah and every other living creature on Earth would have vast amounts of gas dissolved in their blood. Basically, this means that on the collapse of the canopy, this is what would happen to Noah and every other living thing on the planet. Indeed, even if there were merely enough water to cover Everest, a mere 10 kilometers or so, the effect would be indistinguishable.